chair of worship and the chair of the faith formation committees. And, and this week, we're going to hear from two more folk. And I think this is especially important for the new, new persons who have arrived in our uh, church over the last several months to, to learn a little bit more about what goes on in the church. And so today, we're going to hear from uh, two people, Nancy Jacobson, who chairs the Outreach Committee, and Donna Cameron, who chairs uh, the Pastoral Care Committee. So I'll ask Nancy to come forward first, and then Donna to follow. Good morning. My name is Nancy Jacobson. I'm the chair of the Outreach Committee. So what is outreach? Well, I'll start by giving you our uh, mission statement. We are... Or, Outreach organizes and supports our work outside the congregation, educates us as to the work including human rights, social justice, and work toward truth and reconciliation. It includes mission and service, including setting goals for this. Okay, so now, what thing, we well, have already heard of much of our work today. Uh, everything, anything to do with our place, uh, we have the box in the set in the back building here uh, for clothing and that to be donated. And then there's the angel gifts that you've already heard of. And coming up in February, there's the coldest night of the year walk. Uh, so look forward to that. Another thing we do is the Peninsula Food Bank. There is a basket in the back there with the uh, for food donations, uh, please make them non-perishable, as they sometimes take a few weeks for us to get around to delivering them. Uh, we also had uh, the uh, where you put a do dollar in a, a, a oh, job. To be a blessed to be a blessing. We, it was called after John Davidson's thing. Uh, so it was. Uh, where you put a dollar or any other amount into a jar every week and then on thanks, th towards Thanksgiving when it was donated to the food bank to buy food. Coming up shortly, there's the International Right for Rights. Uh, I'm sure you'll hear lots about that. And then, then there's more things that are a little closer to home. Uh, the Stelly School Project, where we uh, donate money towards the uh, uh, snacks and that for a couple of their uh, programs. Uh, Aurora House, that's the uh, uh, subdivided building down on East Sandwich Road here, where we um, uh, take given gift bags and that, and try and develop a a community uh, and, and another thing is indigenous outreach but we've had little things um, one was uh, collecting money for Riley Pelkey's family he was the little boy who was burned badly there several months ago um, and I know I've also been down to the, some of their bingo where they also collected money for him. Okay. And then affirming work. And, and as you've heard, the soup suppers at UVic. So anybody who is interested or thinks this might be a good fit for them are welcome to come and join us. Our next meeting is at a little different time as Several of us had things that we were doing and couldn't re meet at our regular times. So it's at 11.15 on the Wednesday, the, I think it's the 6th of December, but it's the Wednesday, first Wednesday anyway. So if you're interested, speak to Nancy or myself. Oh, thank you.
provides Christ-like comfort and care for people in our congregation and in our wider community. We provide this support through personal visits, phone calls, welcoming newcomers, and regular contact with the congregation, especially those unable to engage in the life and the work of the church. We are guided by our church vision statement and by core values of confidentiality, care, and connection. We're a small committee who formally meet four times yearly, and our work continues between these sessions. Twice yearly, we plan communion visits to selected people in care and in homes. Reverend Bob offered communion, and one or two members of the pastoral care committee joined in the visit. Communion visits were held during Easter and Advent, when the visits were war and the visits were warmly received. As well, Reverend Bob and other members of the committee offer pastoral care through home and hospital visits, phone calls, and occasional visits at coffee shops and restaurants. Again, the visits are well received, and we know Jesus' healing ministry is working when two or three are gathered in his name. We are never alone on these visits. Each year, we've designed and sent out Christmas cards to a wide number of people. This year, the cards are designed to demonstrate our faith in action as we move forward through change both in building and in our ministry. Our committee work also includes Marion Garnett maintaining the Central Sanitary United Historic Role and individuals supporting healing practices such as Healing Pathway and Centering Prayer. Our committee members are Reverend Brough, Bree Young, Pat Rendezzo, Marion Garnett, and Karen Horschel as corresponding member, and myself, Donna Cameron. If you're interested in learning more about this ministry, please contact one of us on the committee. And at this time, I would like to acknowledge Reverend Bob's pastoral care ministry. Much of the ongoing work is done through Reverend Bob's almost daily contact with people within the congregation and within the wider community. This connection, I know, is guided by spirit and faith and more than fulfills the, the mandate of Central Senate United. Our committee is happy to work with Reverend Bob and with each other to support the care and connection within this small but vital church. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Donna. Now, uh, it's time to see if we have any celebrative news to share, birthdays, anniversaries, other kinds of celebrations. Yes, yes. Birthday Tuesday. Your birthday Tuesday. You don't say that with joy. Come on, with joy. <laughs> no joy. <laughs> we'll be joyful then. It's better than the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> Any other birthdays? Yeah. Well, let's see. Is a gift from God, a gift to be shared. Jesus came into our midst as the light of the world, and the Holy Spirit is present to illumine our work and witness. Let us worship, mindful of the light and love of God. Let us now join together to sing our opening hymn.
Rejoice, people of God. Celebrate the life within you and Christ's presence in your midst. Our eyes shall be opened, the presence will have new meaning, and the future will be bright with hope. Rejoice, people of God. With humble hearts come before the one who is our wisdom and our strength. We place ourselves before our God. Come, O God, on this day of rest and prayer to be re-energized. We pray in your image and for your purpose. Keep the lamps of our lives burning. Light the fire of your spirit within each of us. That our minds, hearts, and bodies may be aflame with your love and grace. That we may reach out in love and care to others in your name. Through Christ and in Christ we pray. Amen. this time set aside for children and the child within, I want to consider for a moment light. Light. Let there be. Katie was here to shine that ring, but I won't do that to you. Light. Our Bible reading for today will feature light in the form of ten bridesmaids in their lamp. You know, I certainly gained a new perspective on life when I moved here uh, from Winnipeg <laughs> a few years ago. I lived at that time just next to the thrifty store, and so I would walk home sometimes from church uh, this time of year, of course. It gets pretty dark, <laughs> and it gets a lot darker here than it does in Winnipeg. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is that there's lots of lights in the city, but also there's snow. And even if you're out in the country, deep in the country, it's much brighter because the snow reflects whatever there is to reflect. So this was a new experience for me. And I think the first time I didn't have a flashlight and I bumped into a few trees and fell off the sidewalk <laughs> a few times to get home because it was so dark. So of course, I learned to take a flashlight. Or eventually I got a headlamp, too, that really, really works really well. And I, as I walked now with my flashlight, uh, or my headlamp, I often noticed, as I walked home in the dark, other people with their lights. And sometimes in twos or threes, sharing that light. And for me, it's a, it's a lovely kind of metaphor of thinking how we as Christians are called to share the light, our light, the light of care, kindness, wisdom, and love, to brighten the dark places, the dark situations, and the dark circumstances of life that sometimes folk have a hard time seeing their way through. Now, there's a good old children's hymn that speaks to this sharing of light, which we're going to hear and see now, and I invite you to sing along. Jesus. 
heart. Would you please join with me in our echo prayer? Uh, kindly repeat after me. Gracious God, thank you. Gracious God, thank you. For shining the light of your love and goodness on us. For shining the light of your love and goodness on us. Help us to share that light. Help us to share that light. To brighten our often darkened world. To brighten our often darkened world. We pray in the name of Jesus, the light of the world. Amen. We pray in the name of Jesus, the light of the world. book of Isaiah, we read these words. By waiting in my calm, you shall be saved. In quiet and in trust, your strength lies. With trusting hearts, let us rest in the saving grace of God in a moment now. Today's special song is another well-known and beloved uh, old um, Christian hymn, and you're invited to sing along in the refrain. Uh, I think Mary might have prepared a slide for that.
invite Steve Powell to come forward now to lead us in our readings for today. Let us pray. God of prophets and parables, your word can meet us with a challenge, a puzzle, and a promise. Send your spirit with the gifts of understanding to grasp the puzzle and the courage to take up the challenge and the promise. Through Christ, your living word. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading today is Jesus' parable of the ten bridesmaids. It comes in a section of scripture that offers three parables concerning the matter of waiting, preparedness, faithfulness in the face of the seeming delay of the coming of God's kingdom. And for the early church, the delay in what many believe would be the imminent return of Christ. What might this parable say to us today, 2,000 years removed from its original telling? We're reading from the 25th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come up to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, uh, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And when they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. I'm really looking forward to your explanation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very gentle. From the world around us, a poem based on Psalm 104 by Miriam Therese Winter entitled The Life of All. God of power, God of people, you are the life of all that lives. Energy that fills the earth, vitality that brings to birth the impetus toward making whole whatever is bruised and broken. In you, we grow to know the truth that sets all creation free. You are the song the whole world sings, the promise liberation brings now and forever. Here ends the script readings from scripture in the world around us, and for these words and insights, we give God thanks and thanks. praise. Thanks, thanks be to God. Thank you. Praise. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Steve's challenged me here. <laughs> Actually, this parable of the ten bridesmaids has been trouble for me for a long time. Uh, I thought to myself such things as, why doesn't the groom show up for the wedding <laughs> until midnight. Why does the bride, whoever she is, put up with such a ridiculous delay? Where even is the bride in this story? Why are the so-called wise bridesmaids so stingy and mean? And why, after keeping the poor bridesmaids waiting for hours, 
does the groom blame them for lateness and shut the door in their faces? Such is the kingdom of God, Jesus tells us. Really? <laughs> My uneasy feelings about this particular parable have prevented me from gathering the pieces of it into a single interpretation that I can wrap up and offer to you with a colorful bow. Instead, all I can do is keep the pieces scattered and examine them by turns, or to switch metaphors, to turn this parable around and around in my fingers as if it were a polished diamond, and see what it reveals from each angle within each facet. I won't pretend that my various discoveries cohere and avoid contradiction. They don't. However, maybe this is what we're supposed to do with the parables of Jesus. Maybe we're supposed to let their meanings open out wider, wider, wider. Perhaps the truths the parables reveal are various and many and impossible to lock down. In any case, here we go. Here are some interpretive possibilities for the story of the bridesmaids, and I want to say I'm indebted primarily to Debbie Thomas and her wonderful commentary on this parable, whose insights have enlightened me, and which I share with you. Beforehand, let me offer a brief explanation of weddings in Jesus' day. They were every bit as emotionally freighted as weddings today, with the same potential for mishap. Guests assembled at the home of the bride and were hosted by her parents while waiting for the groom. And when the bridegroom approached, the guests, including the bridesmaids, lit torches and went out to greet him. In a festive procession, the entire party walked to the groom's home where his parents were waiting for the ceremony and the extended banquet that would follow and continue for several days. So, a first interpretive possibility. There is going to be a wedding someday. Really, there is. Here's a potentially uncomfortable question related to this interpretation. When was the last time you heard a sermon all about the second coming of Jesus? Do you even remember such a sermon in our tradition? Now, I know I've made reference to that belief from time to time. However, I don't believe I've ever committed a whole sermon to the topic, and I'm not doing that today. But I wonder, have you ever thought to yourself, oh my goodness, what if it's today? What if today is the day when Jesus returns and God's kingdom comes in all its fullness and our broken earth is restored and made whole as Scripture promises? Many Christians have viewed the delay of the bridegroom as representing the delay in the return of Christ to usher in the kingdom of God in glory and in power. When Matthew wrote his gospel, people of faith were already wondering about the delay. The truth is, most of us don't give any thought at all to this idea of delay any longer. We have grown accustomed to the bridegroom's absence, accustomed and indifferent. His absence and delay are our norms, so much so that deep in our secret hearts, or maybe not so deep and not so secret, we no longer believe he's going to return. We no longer believe there's going to be a wedding. After all, isn't that sci-fi or fantasy a children's story? And people might think we're delusional if we are seriously thinking about the so-called second coming and the rapture and all the things that are associated with that. Maybe. The problem is our scriptures do proclaim Christ's return and does proclaim the fulfillment of God's kingdom. We pray about it every week. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And furthermore, the coming of God's kingdom in all of its healing, justice-making fullness <coughs> is the yardstick against which we measure all of our own healing, justice-making efforts. The wedding feast is our ideal, our goal, our destination. Without that hope, you know, we, we really don't have a standard. We have no accountability, nothing to lean into, nothing to work towards, nothing to anticipate as we labor in God's name. 
The parable of the bridesmaids ends with a wedding, a wedding celebration. Yes, it ends in celebration and joy. And while we may struggle or even reject the passages in Scripture that claim Christ's return, at least in a literal sense, <clears throat> let's not abandon the vision, the hope of this glorious ending because we've grown tired of waiting. Okay, I admit I, I do struggle with this understanding of the parable as being prepared for the end time, being awake for the return of Jesus like lightning flashing across the sky to bring about the celebrated ushering in of the kingdom for those who are ready, who are awake and prepared. So here's another interpretive angle to think about. It's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. Let me repeat that. It's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. In the parable, the bridesmaids have to wait so long for the groom's arrival, they fall asleep. It's not their choice or desire to wait so long. But the five bridesmaids who carry extra oil in their flasks prepare themselves for the long haul, just in case. They consider and take seriously the possibility of surprise, of delay, of hardship, or unpredictability. They don't allow their preconceived ideas about the groom or the party to distract them from what's actually in front of them. They remain open and adaptable to the circumstances in which they find themselves. Do we? Are we ready for the long haul? Do we have the flexibility to handle the unexpected? Or are we clinging to rigid, narrow notions of what God's presence looks like? such that we miss God when God actually shows up. Can we bear an unpredictable bridegroom, a bridegroom who surprises us? If Jesus' notion of time, faithfulness, fulfillment, and celebration look different from ours, will we still follow him into the wedding hall, or will we bail? Okay, let me offer yet another angle on this parable. Sometimes, Doors close. Sometimes doors close. So do what is needful now. You know, I don't like the fact that the five foolish bridesmaids in the parable arrive too late to gain entrance to the wedding. And I don't like the fact that the groom shuts the door in their faces. I don't like the fact that the story of these five women out in the cold. But whether I like these things or not, they happen. Windows do close. Chances do fade. Time does run out. We know this. We experience this regularly. The opportunity to mend the friendship, forgive the debt, break the habit, write the check, heal the wound, confront the injustice, release the bitterness, closes down. The opportunity ends. This is not what we want to happen, of course. So often we tell ourselves, it isn't true. We tell ourselves that there's always tomorrow. That we'll get to it, whatever it is, eventually. That there's still time left. But what if there isn't? What if the parable is telling us to be alert now, awake now? What if it's inviting us to live as, e as if each day, singular and fleeting, is all we have? Tomorrow, if it comes, will be its own gift, its own miracle, its own challenge. Don't presume that it belongs to you. Do what is right and good and necessary now. Okay, let's turn this diamond of a parable some more and look at yet another angle. This interpretive possibility says, you're more valuable than your oil supply. So stick around. <laughs> stick around. The fatal mistake the foolish bridesmaids make is that they leave. They don't stick around. They assume that their oil supply is more important to the groom than their <coughs> presence at his party. So they ditch the scene at its most critical moment and go shopping, thus depriving the bridegroom of their companionship and support and love on his special day. 
wonder if the door closed. <clears throat> so this is a point I want to explore a bit more because I totally get the foolish bridesmaids in this narrative moment. I get how hard it is to stick around when my light is fading and my reserves are low. I get what it's like to scramble for perfection, to insist on having my ducks in a row before I show up in front of God or the church or the world. After all, it's scary and vulnerable making to linger in the dark when my pitiful lamp is flickering, my once robust faith is evaporating, and my measly, leaky flask is filled with nothing but doubt, pain, grief, weariness. Only a bridesmaid who trusts in the groom's deep and unconditional compassion, only a bridesmaid who knows that the groom has light and oil to spare, only a bridesmaid who understands that her presence, messy and imperfect though it may be, is of intrinsic value to the groom, will find the honesty and the courage to stay. The bridesmaids in this parable lack this comprehension and courage. So five of them scatter and the wedding procession suffers as a result. Five fewer lights to brighten the groom's path. Five fewer voices to cry out with joy at his arrival. Five fewer friends to dance and sing the night away in honor of the groom and his beloved bride. The loss is communal, extensive, and real. This is not a situation to celebrate or endorse, it's a situation to grieve. Perhaps the lesson of the parable is this. Don't allow your fear or your sense of inadequacy keep you away from the party. Be willing to show up as you are. Complicated, <coughs> disheveled, half-lit, half-baked. <laughs> the groom delights in you, not in your lamp. Your light doesn't have to dazzle. Remember, God created light. God is light, and Jesus is for us the light of the world. Your half-empty flask of oil isn't the point. You are. So stay. Stick around and join the party. <coughs> All right, let's turn the diamond further around in our hands so that <coughs> another view illuminates us. Aren't the parables of Jesus amazing? <laughs> it says, scarcity isn't a thing in God's kingdom. Quit hoarding. Quit hoarding. Ironically enough, the wise bridesmaids, the wise ones, distrust the sufficiency, generosity, and love of the bridegroom as much as the foolish bridesmaids. Operating on the basis of scarcity and fear, they refuse to share their oil. Smug in their own preparedness and wisdom, they forget that the point of the wedding celebration is celebration, gathering, community, joining, sharing, it doesn't occur to them that their stinginess will have such poor consequences. That it sends their five companions into the midnight darkness. That it diminishes the wedding, depriving the bridal couple and the remaining guests of five lively, caring companions. I'm really not sure what it will take for people to live fully into the abundance of God. Our assumptions about scarcity impoverish the living out of our lives in the way of Christ. Living out of our lives in the way of Christ diminishes the joy of living and sharing that joy with one another. We're so afraid of emptiness, we worship excess. We're so worried about opening doors too wide, we shut them tight. We fear failure, or we lack trust in God's spirit among us, and so we avoid risk, we avoid change, Thereby, miss wondrous opportunities to be church, Christ's body in the world today. We live in dread that there won't be enough to spare, enough resources, enough freedom, enough forgiveness, enough mercy, enough grace. What would it be like to stop all of this? What would it be like to care more about the emptiness in our neighbor's flask than the brimming fullness of our own? final angle to consider in this diamond of a parable. 
What if the bridegroom, that is Jesus, is not the one who slams the door shut? It is possible, given the context in which Matthew's gospel was written, that Jesus isn't the bridegroom in the parable. We know that the Jesus movement of the first century was in conflict with local religious leaders and who considered their Christian peers heretical and even deviant. It's likely that there was plus much discussion around who belonged and who didn't, who was in with God and who wasn't. Sound familiar? One of the great tragedies of the Christian story across history is that we are better known for policing our borders than for welcoming our neighbors. We've been quick to say, I don't know you, to those who believe or practice differently than we do. We have felt safer and more pious behind closed doors than we did with open arms. Maybe this parable is showing us the ugliness of the closed door. Well, these are some interpretive possibilities for Jesus' parable of the bridesmaids. Surely there are other ones other angles, other facets, other questions to ask and challenges to ponder. Which ones speak to you? Where do you see yourself in the story? Where do you see Jesus in the story? To my mind, the doors are always open. And the wedding hall is always full of holy light and abundant life and always ready for us. So let's join the celebration, knowing we are welcome not only at some end time, but right now. Right now. For the risen Christ is always with us, and the kingdom of God is within us, breaking into our world as we live the life to which God calls us. May it be so. begin our response to the word singing the hymn, Come to My Heart. <clears throat>
worship God and to express our love. And part of that involves putting love into action. Let us do so in the act of giving of some of our time and resources as we are able in support of the church and its varied ministry. so that others will grasp the promise of your love and discover your purpose for their lives. Through Christ, our friend and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Producers unsure they will receive a fair return. For workers uncertain about their jobs or looking for new work. For families feeling the stress of economic uncertainty. Open their eyes to new possibilities and open our eyes to ways we can support them. God, by your love. God of compassion. You open our eyes on the world and show us suffering and despair. We see the challenges for health care right around the world. We pray for communities struggling with disease, drought, chronic hunger, unstable or collapsing economic or social systems. We pray for those among us or known to us facing illness, delays in treatment, and uncertain outcomes. Give strength and energy to those who provide care and courage and hope to all who wait for healing. Open them up to your helpful indwelling presence and your presence working in and through others. And open our eyes to needs we can meet. God, by your love. Hear our prayer. God of wisdom, you open our eyes on the world and show us its complexities. We see countries locked in old animosities, 
and communities overwhelmed by fresh upheaval. We pray for those displaced by current conflicts and natural disasters. <clears throat> Open the eyes and ears of leaders to the suffering of their people and other people and to solutions as yet untried. We pray especially for the plight of those affected by the war between Israel and Hamas and the continuing war in Ukraine. We pray for peace and goodwill here in Canada and elsewhere in the world as acts of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia are on the rise in reaction to events in the Middle East. And open our eyes to ways we can participate in resolving situations which break your heart and ours. God, by your love. Hear our prayer. And now, God, as you've heard this prayer of one offered aloud for many, now hear prayers from the silence of our hearts for those persons, places, or situations for which we are moved to offer prayer at this time. God, by your love, hear our prayer. So we pray that your kingdom will come among us in the words Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, our Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us sing together now, Love is the Touch.
I have a different kind of a postlude for you today. In a way, it's a parable of a piece of music, and I use some inspiration from Reverend Bob's sermon. I was taking some notes because I'm going to be doing largely an improvised piece based on a theme, so it's similar in that way in that there can be multiple interpretations. Um, so, uh, just uh, as parables can be looked at from more than one angle, so too can uh, pieces of music that aren't strictly notated, that are known as what's called improvised. So, I noted that um, in Bob's second interpretation, it's not going to the way, go the way you think or want it to go. Well, that might happen. <laughs> um, also, in the third interpretation, there's a thing about um, the foolishness, and that's one of the main things that keeps musicians from learning to improvise, is in, in the, sound, the fear of the sound of being foolish. That was the first thing that we all encounter when we move from notation to getting out of the book. And also, he mentioned a scramble for perfection, and that's what we're doing when we're improvising in a way. We're scrambling for perfection. It's scary and it can be vulnerable. But he also mentioned in his fourth interpretation to find the honesty and courage to stay the course. So we have a choice to abandon or stay the course. And it's a long course for learning how to play music, both using notation, but also learning how to improvise. And um, it, I noted one other thing he said, which I'd like to bring out. Don't allow your fear or sense of inadequacy to keep you away from the party or the practice. So the, um, the story is basically the melody, and then there's the um, various inter interpretations. So this is, um, and also it's a reflection on fall, it's autumn leaves. Starting with the basic story. 